Genesis chapter 46. We've left off on explaining the so-called contradiction with the number of souls who went down to Egypt versus Jacob's family, and then the comparison of Jacob's family in Acts chapter 7 as well. We went through all the names, all the individuals, and it added up very nicely. And what we discovered is that there are no discrepancies in the Bible. And if you were to do the same thing with uh, any numbers that people do nowadays in the workplace or when, you know, they try to calculate their taxes, etc., I mean, it's just normal when you come across discrepancies and you fix the numbers. So it should be normal with the scriptures as well. We went through every individual and name, but we did not explain their meanings. So I'm going to give you the meaning of each and every one of these names. If you're the person that writes down their names and their meanings, then those of you watching will have to pause all the time. Those of you who are writing, uh, God speak to you, all right? I'm going to read a lot, so write it quickly, all right? I'll try to go at a comfortable pace where you can write everything. But I'm going to go through this, all right, because there's just so many. Remember, I'm going through like 50-something uh, names here. <coughs> Hanuk, H-A-N-O-C-H, Hanuk. His name means initiated or dedicated. Initiated or dedicated. The interesting thing is that it was also, uh, Dr. Upman writes here in his Genesis commentary, it was also the name of Canaan's first, uh, Cain's firstborn. It was also the name of Cain's firstborn. Shows right here how much Reuben is pretty much frowned upon. Falu, P-H-A-L-L-U. Now, if you, I'm not going to really give all their names spelled. If you go to Genesis chapter 46, verse 9, you'll see that, right? Yep. So let's go one by one. Falu in verse 9, his name means distinguished. Distinguished. Hezron means enclosed. Enclosed. Hezron means enclosed. Carmi <coughs> means vine dresser. Vine dresser. Carmi means vine dresser. All right. Simeon's son. Jamul. Jamul. His name means day of God. Day of God. Jamim. Jamim. His uh, name means right hand. Right hand. Ohad. Ohad. His name means join together. Join together. Jachin. Jachin. His name means whom God strengthens. Whom God strengthens. Zohar. His name means whiteness. Whiteness. If he lived at today's time, his name would be a racist name. <laughs> he wouldn't survive 10 seconds in Berkeley. All right. Shaul, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Shaul. His name means asked for. Asked for. All right, Levi's son. Gershon means expulsion. Expulsion. That's quite a name. He must have hated the son or something. All right. Kohath means assembly. Kohath means assembly. So you can call your church Kohath, I guess. Merari means bitter, bitter, or flowing, flowing. So either or, it means bitter or flowing. All right, now we come across Judah's son. <coughs> Ur, Onan, Sheila, Ferez. Uh, I believe their names have been explained in the previous Genesis study. So uh, Dr. Altman doesn't have their meanings defined here. We see right here also uh, the grandsons uh, that come out uh, from Judah's line, Hezron and Hamul, Hezron and Hamul. All right. Now, Dr. Upman has one meaning for Hamul here. He says, one who has experienced mercy. One who has experienced mercy. Issachar's son, Tola means scarlet worm. Scarlet worm. Yeah, literally red worm, okay? Now, if you, that's another doctrine where you talk about the lost souls where they transform, just like saved Christians transform to the body of Christ, they transform to the body of their father, who's reptilian, right? 
reptile class. But anyway, it's a whole other story. Fuva means mouth, mouth. Job, this is interesting. It means one persecuted. Wow. One persecuted. And it speaks a lot, you know, concerning about the book of Job, I guess. Shimron means watch. It means watch. Sired means, uh, let's see, we're in Zebulun's son now, verse 14. 14. Sired means fear. His name means fear. Elon, some of you guys already know because you just get into end time so much. His name means oak, obviously, all right? Everyone's into his name now. <laughs> all right. Jalil means uh, whom God has made sick. Whom God has made sick. Zebulun sure has some bad names for his sons. Now we come to verse 16, Gad's children. Verse 16, Gad's children. Ziphion means expectation. Expectation. Haggi means festive. Festive. So if you want to have a party, make sure Haggi goes with you. Shuni means quiet. Quiet. I guess the father had enough of Haggi, you know, so. All right. Esban means toiling. Toiling. So laboring, working. Eri means guarding. Guarding. Arodi means Wild ass, wild ass. It can also mean rover, rover. Now we come to Asher's children at verse 17. Jimna means prosperity, prosperity. Ishua means even or level, even or level. Must be a calm son. Isui uh, also means, believe it or not, even. It also means even. Isui. Bariah means gift, gift, or it could be a very negative meaning. It can mean in evil, in evil. Sarah means abundance, abundance. Heber uh, means, let's see right here, where are we? Uh, fellowship. Heber means fellowship. So if you want to have a good Heber, if you want to have good fellowship, then just say that word. Malkiel. Malkiel means my king is God. Wow. My king is God. Malkiel. Wow. That's a good name for your, for your children, you know? All right. Bila, yeah, it's giving that brother ideas now for, for the future. Okay, he's going to name his child that, all right. But anyway, uh, Beaker means, all right, now we come to, let's see, verse uh, 21, verse 21. Bila and Beaker. Bila means devouring. Bila means devouring. Beaker, his name means a young camel. A young camel. We come to Ashbel now. Ashbel means opinion of God. Opinion of God. It also means short. Short. Perfectly describes YouTube shorts. It's just people's opinions, you know, of God, I guess. <laughs> Gira means fighter. Gira means fighter. Naaman means pleasantness. Naaman means pleasantness. How ironic for the general at the Book of Kings where he wasn't, his skin condition wasn't so pleasant, right? Wow. It was an ugly condition. Ehi means brotherly or joining together. Brotherly or joining together. Rosh means head. Rosh means head. Mapim, all right, means adorned one. Mapim means Adorn one. I couldn't help it, but my thought was thinking about the Muppet Show whenever I read his name. And Hupim, you know, Hupim. 
you know, muffin the puffin. I think there's a, a rhyme on that one. I forgot. But anyway, about the bird. All right, hop him. All right, that's what I think about when I see hop him. All right, hop him names. Uh, Dr. Upman actually does not mention the meaning uh, with his name. So we'll skip down to Ard. Ard. His name means uh, fugitive. It also means rover. Fugitive or it also means rover. Now we come to Dan's children at verse 23. Verse 23. Uh, Hushim means uh, those who make haste. Hushim means those who make haste. Now we come to uh, Naphtali's children. Jaziel. His name means allotted by God. His name means allotted by God. Guni means painted or died. His name means painted or died. Jezer means image or form. Jezer means image or form. Shalem, his name means retribution. Retribution, like vengeance. All right. And uh, we cover all their names now, finally. Okay. Now we come to chapter 46 and verse 28. Chapter 46 and verse 28. The Bible says, And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Meaning that Jacob sends out Judah his sons before his face to go ahead and meet Joseph, and also to direct his face, to direct him towards Goshen, where they're supposed to be headed. And so they all arrived in the land of Goshen. Now remember, if the way that I explained the verse sounds pretty redundant, it's because I'm trying to explain each and every word here. So remember to look at the verse, pay attention to each and every word, and see as... Uh, I explain the verse, look at the words, and make sure the words match up with my explanation. It's interesting to note that Jacob, he does not send out Reuben. He sends out Judah. It speaks volume about Judah's life, how much it's different from Reuben's life. When you read Reuben's life, you would think that he would be the good guy concerning when Joseph was sold as a slave. Reuben was the one more empathetic. Reuben was the one who wanted to make things right. Judah, however, was the one who proposed the idea to sell Joseph as a slave. Uh, the huge difference with Reuben and Judah, as I've explained to you before, we see Reuben's life, <clears throat> how he can picture Cain's life in a life of good works. Reuben offered to make a sacrifice of his children, but uh, Jacob would not even uh, listen to that. Judah, he just simply said, I'll take the blame forever. And Jacob's like, I can count on Judah. So notice how much he trusted Judah's word above Reuben's word. We've seen that constantly throughout the account of Genesis. It'll be important for you to keep uh, these two men's lives in your mind when you read the Bible and in future passages when you read about Reuben or Judah. The Lord might show you something. So keep those things in mind. <clears throat> Verse 29 and Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. So Joseph prepared him, uh, pre prepped up his chariot and then he rode his chariot to meet his father Israel, that's Jacob's other name, in the land of Goshen. Joseph presented himself to his father and then usually this is the thing when they meet or when they're weeping. He falls on his neck, so it's right over here, and then weeps on it for a good while, for a good length of time. Verse 30, And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. So Israel, <clears throat> he says to Joseph, I can die now because I've seen your face, uh, because you are still alive. You might recall at chapter 46, and verse, let's see right here, 4, chapter 46 and verse 4, you might recall, God promised Jacob that he would 
be able to see Joseph, and Joseph would be the one that would close his eyes at death, which is why Jacob was able to say those words at verse 30, because he meets Joseph, so now he's, he can die in peace since Joseph can shut his eyes at death. Verse 31, And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. So Joseph says to his brothers and to his entire household of his fathers, I'm going to go up ahead, show myself to Pharaoh, and then say to him, My brothers and the entirety of my father's household who lived in the land of Canaan, have arrived, have met me. Verse 32, And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. So all these people are shepherds. That's their trade, that's their living, is to feed cattle, their livestock. They brought their flocks, their herds, and everything that they've got since they're shepherds. Verse 33, and it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, what is your occupation? That ye shall say, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Okay, so what we see right here is that Joseph keeps explaining to his family, it's just going to so happen when Pharaoh calls on you and asks you, what's your occupation? You're going to answer this way. Uh, your servant's trade, your servant's work has always been around cattle ever since we were young up till now. That includes us and also our forefathers. Joseph says, explain yourselves that way to Pharaoh. That way you can live in the land of Goshen. And the reason why is because the Egyptians, they despise every shepherd. They despise shepherds. Shepherds are an abomination to Egyptians. So it's important to explain yourselves to Pharaoh. That way Pharaoh can get a heads up and then he can uh, make sure that you live comfortably in Goshen uh, without the Egyptians despising you. So notice right here again at verse 34 that uh, Ham's descendants that we see Ham's descendants actually being discriminatory and racist uh, toward Semites. So it never started with white people. It didn't start with Japheth. They didn't read their Bible. It has always been the case with every ethnic group from beginning to even now. When we look at verse 34, some of the commentators, they explain... And I'm open to it. I'm actually open to it because there's a historical, uh, there's a historical background that I believe Frederick Widdowson mentioned and that I refer to in our intermediate discipleship is that the earlier pharaohs, they were known as Hyksos or Hyksos, whatever you want to pronounce it. Yeah. But these Hyksos were also known as shepherd kings. So they were a mixture of Assyrian or Semitic that mingled with the Egyptians, and they ruled over Egypt. So the current Egyptians in Joseph's time, they experienced some oppression, some attention, uh, from some tension, excuse me, tension from the so-called shepherd kings who reigned as pharaohs before them. And that was something that they truly despised, that they truly hated. Uh, that's no surprise when you look at today's history as well, all right? They look at uh, the ethnic group of the previous leader's background, and then there's the spite, and there's even discrimination and racism. So nothing changed, you know? History repeats itself, just like today's generation. Dr. Ruckman, he, however, mentions this part about why the shepherds uh, are an abomination to the Egyptians. The interesting part, when we look at this passage, is that shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians because, let's see right here, I'm going to add a little note here.
Remember what the children of Israel worshipped uh, when they got out of Egypt? All right. Yeah, a cow. Cattle. All right. So they dealt with cow. Now, in this passage, it's true that uh, Joseph's brothers, they were taking care of flocks, and that can include cows. But cattle, when you look at the Word of God, it doesn't have to necessarily... Uh, mean cows, it can refer to basically livestock. Yeah. So, when you think about cattle or livestock, what did Jacob's family major in, so to speak? Which specific animals would they major in? Sheep, right? That's why they're called shepherds, because they take care of sheep. Yeah. Now, what was an abomination to the Egyptians about shepherds is... Dr. Uckman believes, is because of the sheep. The sheep are considered to be abomination to the Egyptians. Now, you'll notice that in, when you study the history of Egypt, what they prefer, what they deify, are strange animals that just refer to Satan for some weird reason. They make a big deal about cats. It's strange that the scriptures are silent about cats. I mean, they give such a negative connotation on dogs, but when it comes to cats, the scriptures are just completely silent on that one. The only clue that you'll see referring to felines is actually Revelation 13, and that's a leopard, which is the Antichrist. So there's something strange about that. They, the Egyptians had an infatuation with animals that very much displeased the Lord. Remember, they wouldn't deify a certain animal unless it's one within their locality, but more so two certain personality traits that they like about the animal, that they admired about the animal. That's the reason why the Lord mentioned some negative connotations about cats in the Bible, because there are certain personality traits that are not good. Now, some idiots online, and I rightfully say idiots, they, start, they complain to our church, they complain everywhere that Brother Kim teaches that you shouldn't have a cat. Cats are so evil, you know. I love my cat, and you know what? Just shut up, all right? The reason why, before, you know, uh, I understand, and I'll explain to the people, but the reason why I'm saying that is because I had idiots who tried to, like, pretend, you know, that they're reporting me to the higher-ups and pouring out complaints. This is what this guy said. Can you stand this guy? This is what he's teaching his members. I got members who have cats, fool idiots at their finest man but anyway so no that's not what i said unless you're mentally ill which probably some of these people are they don't have half a brain and that's why they did something so immature something so ridiculous like that but going back to the main point is that there's certain traits about the animal that the egyptians like that are negative see that aren't positive which is why the lord he uh didn't like the cats and didn't mention much about them but the sheep is what the is the pick for the lord right why is that the certain personality trait right it's dumb it's innocent it's white it's pure that's the important thing to god is that the purity of it the innocence but it's also dumb he likens his children that way which is why the Lord is very compassionate toward us. God. He's very compassionate toward us because he sees us as just simply dumb creatures who don't know any better. Hey. And we did start out in innocence, so he's willing to uh, bleed and die. Devils are likened to fowls, though. And the Lord never sees them as sheep but fowls. <clears throat> There's, that's the reason why the Lord gives more mercy to humans than to devils. It's something that the devils know better. Whereas uh, the sheep or the humans, there's something they don't know any better, right? That's the difference. But anyway, sheep are considered, that kind of positive trait, abomination to Egyptians. Now that's a horrible thing, but they have a cow. And if you know the devil, the devil, he has horns, right? He has horns. He is called cherub. If he's called cherub in the Bible, in Ezekiel, cherub uh, refers 
to a calf, actually, or to a cow. It can refer to ox, either or. Uh, I make sometimes the distinguishing, but I'm open to them being all similar. The Egyptians uh, like cows, something about the devil's horns, or something strange about that that they have an infatuation with. But the Lord, he makes a bigger deal about sheep. Sheep are the bigger deal to him. Isn't it interesting that the Egyptians, they deify the cows, and what did the Lord do with that? He killed them all at the plague, right? When the Lord sent out a plague, he wiped out the cattle. He wiped out the cows. Why? To wipe out their gods. They made a big deal about cows, but sheep were an abomination to them. Isn't it interesting that the Egyptian, for them to be saved and rescued, the Lord had to humble them by saying, you need to take that sheep's blood and put it on your doorpost so that your family could be saved. No Egyptian in their right mind would stoop low to that level because it's an abomination to them. Wow. It's detestable to them. So then the Lord says, unless you humble yourself, swallow your pride, and realize that your cow is dead and there's nothing to it, and you go by my method, you take a sheep's blood for the sacrifice, then you can be saved. They did it. They did it. The Lord, he will do that. He will destroy the world's methods of doing things. He will kill the world's methods of doing things and force that world to realize you need to do it my way, but the world don't want to do it. Why? It's abomination to them. It's detestable to them. They will call you narrow-minded. They will call you bigoted. They're going to call it hate speech. They're going to call it racist, discriminatory, whatever they will call it. They will put you as part of the Southern Poverty, Poverty Law Center of the hate groups or whatever. It doesn't change the fact that you have to swallow your pride and they have a pride issue. That's their problem. All it comes down to is pride. They want to do their way, their way. So God will destroy your way completely to humble you and make sure you realize you need to do it my way or else. My way is the only way that can save you. But they refuse to do that. That is the world's problem. Egypt completely pictures the world, no doubt about it. <clears throat> when we go to Genesis chapter 47 now, and verse 1. Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. So Joseph arrived and told Pharaoh by saying these words, My father and my brothers, their flocks, their herds, all that they own are come. Uh, they left the land of Canaan, and now, lo and behold, they're in the land of Goshen. So Joseph takes five of his brothers, and he presented them to Pharaoh. In verse 3, And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. So Pharaoh says to Joseph's five brothers, uh, What's your occupation? What's your trade? They say to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both us and also our father, forefathers before us. They said moreover unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land are we come. For thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. They also said to Pharaoh, uh, we came to the land of Egypt, Egypt to sojourn. So remember, that means to temporarily reside. Even though it's not a permanent resident, uh, residency, they're residing. Your servants uh, have no pasture to feed or to take care of their flocks because the famine is so grievous, it's so heavy, it's so sore in our home, the land of Canaan. So we ask you, to let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Verse 5, And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, 
then make them rulers over my cattle. Okay, meaning, Pharaoh speaks to Joseph by saying these words. Your father and your brethren have come to meet you, to be with you. Hey, the land of Egypt is in front of you. Take it all, the best of the land. Make sure that your father and your brothers live in. In the land of Goshen, that will be the particular place you're going to let them live in. That's the best of the land. If you know any men of similar activity among them, among those people, which is obviously being shepherds or taking care of sheep, then have your brothers be the leaders, the ones in charge over my cattle to take care of all of my livestock. So basically, they're in charge of Pharaoh's men. They're in charge of uh, the people who live with Pharaoh, who take care of cattle and who might also take care of some sheep. Verse 7, And Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers, in the days of their pilgrimage. All right, so Joseph, he uh, brings in Jacob, his father this time, not his five brothers. He sets Jacob before Pharaoh's presence, and then Jacob, he blesses Pharaoh. Pharaoh says to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob, his answer is a good sermon, actually. It's something that speaks volumes. He says to Pharaoh, all the days of the years of my journeying, so pilgrimage, that's described in the Bible, basically your travel, your journey in life, your life's journey, are basically 130 years. There have been few and evil times in my days, within the years of my life. But they didn't attain, uh, they didn't meet up to the days of the years of the lives of my forefathers during their days of their pilgrimage. Now, Jacob's word speaks volume right here. His message is, in, uh, is a sinner or a backslider or some worldly Christian who didn't live really well for the Lord, admitting not during his life. During his life, the Lord had to, I mean, he had to spank him over and over again to get Jacob back into the right path. Jacob is a typical backsliding Christian in today's Laodicean age. He pictures today's Laodicean Christians very well. You've seen how the Lord, he would keep dealing with you over and over and over again, yet you just keep repeating the same action, right? You're basically Jacob. And then it's not until you reach the end of your life. When Jacob reaches his end, then he has the mature mindset. He realizes that the life that he living, he's been living in, his own way to gain worldly success, has not been the happy life. It has not been a fulfilling life. It hasn't been he realized that there were few and evil days within his life's journey. That's what it's going to come down to. You don't see it now because you're like Jacob. You're still pursuing your own path and refusing to open your eyes to get right with the Lord. But once you reach life's end, then you're going to open your eyes. You're going to realize, I wasted my life. How many years of my life have I wasted? And you're going to realize that the attempts you made to gain worldly success have been few and evil, has been few and evil. So there were some regrets, notice, in Jacob's life. Yeah. It didn't meet up the standards of your fathers, how they lived their lives for the Lord. When you look at the martyrs, right? The early Christians, the missionaries during the Great Awakening revivals and the great preachers during the time of missions, we would go, we don't meet up to them. 
We don't meet up to them. Is that going to be your speech when you reach the end of your life? Is that going to be your admittance? Are you going to say, you know, few and evil have been the years of my life? Pharaoh, he just simply asked Jacob how old he was. That was all he asked him. But Jacob, he went on a rant after he gave his years. He realized within his years there were regrets. There were things that bothered him. Now, this speaks volume about Jacob's rant at verse 9 because he's old. When you get older, what do you tend to do? You rant. You talk more, right? You tend to talk more. You wouldn't talk that much unless there's something that's still stuck in your brain. Now, when you're old, you lose memories. You don't remember everything. It's amazing that Jacob, when he reached the end of his life, what he remembered what stuck to him was not his worldly successes, but the evil he's done in his life. Now, that should be very eye-opening. That's going to stick to you. That's going to be basically more meaningful to you is living life for God rather than the worldly successes. Now, you definitely don't feel that now. You don't see that now. But when you reach his age, you will. And when you reach his age, remember this, there's no turning back. There's absolutely no turning back. That's why you got to start living for God now. Uh, you don't want to repeat Jacob's mistake. When he reaches his end, what he gains is regrets, not satisfaction. So let me repeat that again. He gains regrets, not satisfaction. So all of his worldly successes that he attempted in his life, he's not satisfied. Now that's a sad life to live. Whereas you read uh, Isaac's life, you read Abraham's life, uh, they lived longer years, I believe, uh, than Jacob. They lived a more fulfilling life. They lived a more happy life. Nothing better than living right for the Lord. Now, the ideal passage is Ecclesiastes 12. The most ideal passage for any worldly Christian or bachelor in Christian, is Ecclesiastes chapter 12. This is the man, King Solomon, who had everything. What, I, what do I mean by everything? I mean whatever he saw, he got. There's a passage in Ecclesiastes, whatsoever my eyes had looked upon, he got it. This was a man who literally had everything. But notice, before he died, this was his last book he wrote that he stated. This is what he concluded. His conclusion, his end, he realized the same thing like Jacob. It's when you reach the end, you come to this same conclusion. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. After uh, mourning about all the worldly successes, he concludes in verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So here's the, his end statement he realized. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In the end, it comes down to serving God, living for God. Is this, what's your speech? Is your speech this? Few and evil have been the days of my life. I didn't meet up to my other brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Notice what the Bible says about this journeying, this travel, or race. So how's your journey? How's your race, your walk so far? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Notice what the Bible talks about the Christian walk. Jacob mentioned, I didn't meet up my father's. Why? Because those are the cloud of witnesses. Wow. Those are the evidences that he's going to have to compare himself to, that you and I will have to compare ourselves to. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice that in our race that we're going to have a cloud of witnesses to compare ourselves to. 
So it's so important, the author urges to lay aside your weight and your sin. Now, it's easy uh, to explain to other people here why you might skip your Bible reading, why you slipped up into that fleshly weakness, or, you know, you can give these excuses where you're trying to make people to sympathize and understand you. And that works all the time in counseling. You never receive any guilt or blame. So you can get away with that. But here's the thing. In, uh, what every psychologist will admit is that the client is always self-centered. And what they believe in, they have to get out of their self-centered state and try to think about others. They realize that's a powerful, effective tool. Amen. Well, the Bible is way ahead of that. But they wouldn't dare lay the blame, right? That's their problem, the counselors. Well, God is more upfront with you. He'll tell you, no, it is your fault. Uh, that's the reality. Psychologists will try to cover it, out, cover it up, pretend it don't exist when it does. So it is your fault. You are to be blamed. And those excuses won't amount a hill of beans when you compare yourself to others. When you mourn about your problems, you're only thinking about yourself. But when God brings up all these witnesses, or let's say there's another person who's suffering as much as you, you wouldn't dare mourn your complaint. All right, think about it. If you think that you can, okay, look at all these people in this room. Uh, if I were to give you this pulpit and tell us, okay, tell us your greatest complaint, what you're going through. Show us why you're suffering more than us. It's quiet in here, right? You, 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 wouldn't ha you wouldn't dare. And you know why. You know why. You're afraid somebody else's pain is greater than yours, and you'll just embarrass yourself. The judgment seat of Christ is a great embarrassment show. Shame, the Bible says. So here you are. You, uh, got, you have to give an account of your life. Here's your chance to tell God why you didn't serve him, why you neglected why you messed up in sin, why you backslid here and there. Here's your chance. When you say it, you're just saying words of embarrassment with those cloud of witnesses right there. God has them ready, lined up for you. So this is so important to keep in mind. It's interesting. Hebrews 12, the author, when he says race, I really believe he's thinking about the same word as Jacob pilgrimage, life's journey, because the context continues when you look at chapter 11 and verse 38. Chapter 11, verse 38. Notice right here, they're wandering in this world. They're sojourners. They are not people who live in this world. The world was not worthy of them. Notice it's described as life's journey. Life's journey. All right, we're going to go back to Genesis again. We're going to go back to Genesis. Chapter 47. And verse 10. Uh, you can write this last verse down. We're not going to turn there because it's so common. But 2 Timothy 4, 7. 2 Timothy 4, 7, that passage. That's the verse you want to end your life with. Yeah. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Uh, if you were to ask me, what's your life verse? When I sign Bibles, the verse is that one. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That is my life's verse. A uh, little bit to disclose myself. The verse before that was actually at uh, 1 Corinthians, and it was chapter 9, verse 24. That was my previous life verse. Basically, uh, that you should run to obtain. Knowing not they which run a race, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. At my beginning years at PBI, that was my life verse because I was thinking there's so much I must catch up. There's so much I've got to do. If I want something from God, I've got to earn it. I've got to work hard for it. I've got to do my best for it. Now is switched to this one, 2 Timothy 4, 7. Because the Lord has blessed me and made my cup full. But I want to make sure that I keep it that way. I want to finish well. I want to keep it that way. All right, Genesis chapter 47. And uh, we'll, read verse uh, we'll read verse 10. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh 
and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of, land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. So Jacob, he blesses Pharaoh. He left the presence of Pharaoh. And then verse 11, Joseph makes sure that he sets up his father and his family pretty well, gave them a place to possess, to own in the land of Egypt, which is obviously the best of the land. And that's in the land of Ramesses. So Ramesses and Goshen are the same region with each other. They lived in the best of the land. Ramesses has been quite mentioned in Egyptian history. So that is a very prosperous, that is one of the best places in Egypt. As Pharaoh commanded, Joseph made sure his family stayed in the best part of the land. Verse 12, and Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. So Joseph made sure that he nourished, he fed his father and his family well and his father's entire household with bread accordingly to their families. He made sure that all the families are fed. Okay, uh, this matches up very well when we go to the book of John 6 and Acts 16. John 6 and Acts 16. Joseph pictures, typifies Jesus Christ. We've seen that constantly throughout the scriptures. Uh, I mentioned to you before, Joseph pictured Jesus Christ who gives the bread of life. But in this passage right here, we see more specifically that Joseph gives life to his family, basically bread of life, so they can survive. They don't die in the famine. When he gives that bread of life to them, it's for the invitation is open to everybody. The invitation is open to everybody within his father's household. Jesus Christ gives, extends that invitation of the bread of life, not just to you, but to your household as well. In John chapter 6, notice the wording of Jesus Christ. He offers it to whosoever, pretty much anyone who would come to him. In verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He, so that's any individual, that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. We go, right, uh, we go onward that Jesus Christ, the people that the Father gives to him, he takes care of. We notice right here in verse, let's see right here. Verse 39, uh, verse 37, verse 37, there we are. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Picturing the fa Joseph's father brings the people to his son, and the son, Joseph, takes care of the people the father gave to him. Matching up John 6. I don't know if you saw that one. John 6, 37. The father gives to the son, Jesus Christ, the people... And Jesus Christ makes sure he takes care of them. How about that? With the bread of life. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And then verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Notice right here. And thy house. So the household is included in believing on Christ for salvation. And Jesus Christ says, Whoever believes on me will receive that bread of life. Okay, going back to Genesis. Joseph constantly pictures Jesus Christ very well when we look at other passages. Now we come to a very interesting passage. A very interesting passage. If the apocalypse were to happen, and if Y2K did actually happen, and you think that you're going to go through the, uh, the life of everything in turmoil, then this is the passage for you. Uh, Pastor Hilton Smith said a little bit about this, which was interesting. 
Genesis 47, verse 13. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Okay, basically, there was no more bread throughout all the land of Egypt. The famine was extremely sore and severe. That as a matter of fact, the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan in their entirety were fainting uh, due to the reason, uh, due to the famine. So Joseph, he piles up, he stores up all the money that he can find in the land of Egypt and in Canaan, saves them up, saves up money. Why? For the, it was all from the bread that they bought. The people bought bread, so he saved up all the money. So Joseph uh, stored up the money into one of the most dependable places, the United States Treasury, all right, where we're never in debt from trillions of dollars. So he brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. So notice right here, the money is down. The money fails them and throughout all the land of Egypt and in Canaan. So all the Egyptians go, go to, notice right here, they go to a liberal. They go to an unsaved atheist. They go to, they go to some PhD. No, they go to a saved believer. If one of the best ways where you can save your uh, country is you need to make sure that there are saved believers who are, making, who are in charge. Saved believers ought to be in charge. Why? Because they would make the right godly decisions and most of your problem is not really an economic problem. It's actually more of a godly spiritual problem which causes the economic problems. Remember, because of sin, that's why they're suffering. That's why there are problems. So you have to resolve sin first. They all go to a saved believer, Joseph, and they ask him, hey, please give us uh, food to eat, give us bread. Why should we die in, in, in your presence? The money is failing. The gold standard is failing. The silver is failing. Everything's failing. So what are we going to do? In verse 16, and the Bible says, and Joseph, like Joseph Biden was yawning and walking away whenever he was asked questions. No, thank God Joseph's not like jo Joseph Biden, right? So it's not, we're not talking about Joseph Biden right here. <laughs> and Joseph said in verse 16, give your cattle and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. So Joseph takes action. He takes action to take good care of his people as a saved believer. Our current Joe is not really doing that. He ditches any time that there's a tough question brought up or there's something that he ought to do. Just taking a nap and licking his ice cream cone. So Joseph, he responds this way. This is how he takes action. Give me your cattle. I'm going to uh, give you for your cattle if money fail. Meaning, as we continue on, I'll summarize it together. Verse 17, and they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. All right, meaning that the Egyptians, they brought their cattle to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread to eat as a trade-off, exchanging for their cattle. And notice the cattle is their horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and then also the donkeys. So he kept feeding them bread in exchange for their cattle during that year. So it's only lasted one year. If you might recall, throughout the famine, they already passed, uh, I think it was about three years, uh, uh, no, they already passed uh, two years of famine. And then... Uh, Joseph mentioned at chapter 45, verse 11, there are five years left. So then, here goes year number three, I believe, perhaps. And they survived the famine. 
In verse 18, when that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. Okay, meaning this, all right? Notice how I explain, and it matches with the words here. In verse 18, so when the, that year ended, where they were exchanging cattle with bread, the Egyptians came to Joseph the second year, not meaning the second year of the famine, but basically the year after that first year of the exchange. So now they're coming to the second year of the communication of the exchange. What are they going to do? They say to him, hey, we're not going to hide it uh, from our Lord here. We're going to just be frank with you. Our money is all spent. It's gone. You, our Lord, ha have our herds of cattle, and there's nothing that's left that should be left over in your eyes, in your sight that you see, except all you see is our bodies and our property. So why should we die uh, in front of you, before your eyes, both us and our land? I want, uh, we want you to buy us and our property for the food to eat, and both us and our property will become servants to Pharaoh. We're going to serve him. We're going to uh, be workers for him. Please give us seed. Now, this means the seed for the bread. That's what it means. So that they can start planting. You're going to see that later on. So that we can survive. We can live and we don't die. And so also the land doesn't become desolate. That's why they need seed. So that they can have plantation. They can have vegetation and life. In verse 20, and Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh. So Joseph, he bought uh, the entire uh, land of Egypt for the king, for Pharaoh, because the Egyptians sold ev uh, every one of themselves, every human being of themselves, also their field, their property, because the famine just overwhelmed them. So the property became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. So concerning the people, Joseph, he removed them from their, basically their farms, from the countryside, and put them into cities instead. Cities from one end to the other end, basically the borders of Egypt. So he went throughout, uh, that's basically a figure of speech of everywhere from one side of Egypt to the other. He made sure to put them in cities where they can be fed, where they can be taken care of well. Usually when people want something or they have needs, they always go to a city, right? Because countryside is usually desolate. So that's why Joseph did that. Now there are several important things to note here about Joseph's welfare program for the economy. So some people might like to use this for a socialist agenda, but there are, and it is true, there are some things that look a little bit left-wing or socialist. But there are some things here that they're overlooking, that they're not paying attention. So this is not a communist socialist setup. There are several problems here. One is this, uh, some people might use this where they can reach to a point to a very communist, a very bad point where, hey, everything is gone, so we have to give our properties to the government. We have to give ourselves to the government. We have to be civil workers. That's why, uh, was it Thomas More? He, uh, he wrote a book called Utopia, which I read at Berkeley. And it supposed to, supposedly shows what a beautiful, wonderful city it'll be. It'll be a utopia if everybody was a civil worker of the government. So they were all designated their tasks, their duties, and they all had an equal pay and level. There would be no jealousy, no covetousness, and, you know, la-la land, man. <laughs> That's la-la land. 
But that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to say right here at verse 21, see, Joseph designates places for them to live. And that also at verse 19, they become civil workers of the government. But they weren't reading everything right here. If they were uh, reading what's going on, I'm going to continue on everything and then show some of the faults right here which I can't because it's past the time. So I'll explain what's wrong with some of the communist and socialist mindset of this welfare program. So we'll cover it next time. And then, Lord willing, we'll cover another chapter. We're this close to the end. We're this close to the end. Father God, I thank you so much for the truth of thy words and how each and every word can explain and open our eyes to some things we never thought of before. I pray we've learned something important. We'll take some of these things and not just hear them, and not just write them down and not just learn them, but to apply and practice them out of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.